uh, introduce Jim Davis, who is our guest today. And in the five years that I've been making these introductions, I have to tell you that Jim is, is rather unique uh, among the very uh, uh, impressive guests that we've had. This is the first time we have welcomed as a speaker a saxophone playing, award winning, entrepreneurially minded professor from Notre Dame who has been blessed by the Pope. <laughs> so I think, that's, I think that's pretty a source of great distinction. And even better, and even better, we are able to welcome his mother, Mrs. Davis, and his two sisters, Janine and Anne, who are with us in the audience and have driven up from Provo. So <laughs> welcome to you today. Jim is, uh, is, a, is, I'm sure, will prove to be a unique and fascinating speaker. If you've looked at his bio, uh, it would be easy to conclude that he is several speakers in one. Uh, at Notre Dame, uh, Dr. Davis is responsible for getting that prestigious university's entrepreneurial programs off the ground. That was, in part, why he was recognized uh, by the University of Notre Dame with its uh, prestigious President's Award for his contributions there. He launched the Guizhou Center of Entrepreneurial Studies at Notre Dame in 1998, and in the 10 years that he served as its director, it uh, was consistently ranked among the top 20 programs in the country, rising at one point uh, to number two. Uh, the Academy of Management, which is the premier professional association for professors of management, uh, honored him uh, as well for his research on trust, saying it was the theoretical research of the decade of the 1990s. He's been named Notre Dame's College of Business MBA Outstanding Professor of the Year three times uh, during his career and received many other very impressive teaching awards. He became the John F. O'Shaughnessy Chair of Family Enterprises in 2006. He earned his undergraduate degree uh, and his Master's of Education at BYU before deciding to get an MBA at Idaho State. So he understands this region of the country very well. He received his doctorate in corporate strategy from the University of Iowa. Uh, and just in case his academic credentials aren't impressive enough to you, he's also a musician. He's toured Europe with an all-American woodwind symphony and recorded music at Radio City Hall, Music Hall in New York City. Now, if there are any of you who would like to hear about how he got blessed by the Pope on a special New Year's Eve Mass, maybe you'll ask that question when we open up the convocation to questions at the conclusion of his formal remarks. Now, when Jim, when we scheduled Jim to come out uh, today, I said, you know, Jim, try to think up a flashy title that will grab these kids in the first you know, weeks of January when it's kind of dreary and cold and slippery outside. Uh, and, uh, you know, he thought about that and said, well, how about if I talk about how to build a business and sell it for 500 million? And I thought, yeah, that'll do. That, that's a, that sort of catches uh, the attentions. And, and that's exactly what one of his executive MBA students did. And that's what he's going to talk about today. So please join me in giving Dr. Jim Davis a warm Huntsman School of Business welcome. Thank you. Jim? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. It's my pleasure to be with you today. Um, I feel like I'm a native son of Utah. I uh, grew up here. Um, actually, I was born in Twila. Is anybody from Twila here? If you know the Twila fight song, the fight song goes, here we are to stay until we die, <laughs> forever and forever in Tooele. And it's funny because I, I, people are leaving Tooele all the time and they're not dying. Um, but uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. And, and thank you for that introduction. Um, I am from the University of Notre Dame and it doesn't no matter where I go in the world, the very first thing people want to talk about is football. And so I want to give you the rundown on football. Okay, here it is. My teams. Here are my teams. First team, University of Iowa. Won their bowl game. One of the few in the Big Ten. Okay. Second team, Fighting Irish. Beat the Miami con uh, convicts, uh, uh, Hurricanes. <laughs> my Irish won. I had another team that won. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> I know, I know, I know. But another team won their bowl game. That was you guys. That's right. <laughs> and I want to know a little bit more about this. I drug it in from the newspaper. Partied like it was 1993. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah, well, it must have been a heck of a party. <laughs> and that was the byline in your newspaper. Party like 1993. OK. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. Football, love it. We can, if you have any questions about Notre Dame football, yeah, we'll deal with that. This is what I want to talk about today. This is the deal for today. I want to talk about how to launch a business revolution. I want to talk about how you guys can launch big deals, big business. Let me introduce you to somebody. This gentleman right here, his name is Bill Godfrey. He was in my class 10 years ago. I teach corporate strategy primarily at Notre Dame. And he was in my executive MBA corporate strategy class. And Bill wrote a business plan. I require all my students to write business plans. And by the way, it didn't matter with, if they come from Coca-Cola, uh, Roche, Bear, I have exec, uh, Disney, Provo Craft and Novelty President was in my class. They come in from all over the country. And with all of my classes, I require them to write a business plan to launch the next big venture, either within their existing business or a new venture, their choice. Well, Bill here decided to write a new venture. The year was uh, about 2001. And he decided to do a web-based business. <laughs> now, remember back in 2001 to what happened to web-based businesses? It was not a good time to launch a web-based business. But Paul wanted, and I, the plan was a pretty good plan. The plan was a pretty good plan. Well, he, this is the name of his business, a Primo, an integrated marketing software, software, web-based software. And here's Bill. I'm going to be CEO, chairman of the board. And I sat back and thought, oh, Bill, Bill, <laughs> you sure? But the plan was a good, good plan. It was easy to get investment for his plan. You know what? His company is, is in 150,000 businesses around the world. He's in one third of the top uh, Fortune 100 companies. That's incredible. And here comes the title for my talk. And I was thinking, my gosh, it was December. It was cold. And I thought, man, I've got to come up with a topic. And then on December the 23rd, my topic came. Bill sold his company for $525 million. And I thought, Bill, adopt me. <laughs> Bill. <laughs> I thought, Bill, you wrote the plan in my class. I'm good for some of this. Take me to McDonald's. <laughs> and this comes out in the Indianapolis Star. He sold his business. $525 million, 10 years. 10 years. An idea, an idea that he turned in 10 years. So my question then, as I thought about this, I thought, you know, I've dealt with a lot of different businesses, big deals and small deals. I've dealt with burrito stands. Um, I've dealt with hotels and restaurants. I've dealt with tires. I've dealt with high tech, low tech, no tech. And I sat back at that point and I thought, why? Why did Bill make it and the other 150 students in the class well, they made it within their businesses, but not, like, not Bill. Bill's going to be sitting on a beach soon. The bottom, what makes a big success? Why do some company executives or entrepreneurs make it big and others don't? And it's what I did as I thought about this. I thought of, I thought of key principles that I've experienced in my life working with businesses over the past 25 years around the globe that make the big ones, that make the $500 million deals. And again, you don't have to be an entrepreneur. I've done this with vice presidents. I've done this with supervisors. But in every case, the principles I'm going to share with you hold. In every case. All right? And so I'm just going to walk through these principles. At the end, I plan on going for <laughs> the dean knows me by now. I'm going to say 45 minutes. I'll go an hour. <laughs> we'll go through these. We're going to go through these points. 
And this first one I consider perhaps, I'm going to say this about all of them, the most important point. And here it is. Lesson number one. The next revolution begins with a big idea. A big idea. Um, in fact, uh, Collins and Porras in their, in their article would call it a big, hairy, audacious idea. Not little. What is your biggest dream? If you wanted to completely revolutionize an industry, and I don't care whether it's a, a class at the university or a, a pizza, and you wanted to come up with something truly revolutionary, what is your big idea? Investors are looking for big ideas. Bill got $18 million in investment in short order on his big idea. A deal that we did with Intel got $4 million investment within, within months because it was a big idea. I want to talk about this. What is a big idea? And big idea starts with vision. And here's what I have found. We need to have better vision. We need more than anything in this world, we need vision. Because we don't see far enough. We don't see clearly enough. And we, we don't see it soon enough. I'm going to be talking about time in a little bit here. Because there's, some, there's an issue of time, and if you miss that opportunity, you've missed an opportunity. In fact, there are very few people who can look objectively and clearly beyond the boundary of their present circumstances. You've got to think big. You've got to, you can't be bounded by, uh, let me tell you, I'll tell you, it, I've taught non-business students and I've taught business students. We as business students, we learn how to manage risk. Managing risk kind of brings in our vision. So we don't think as big. I work with non-business students. They don't even know the rules. They think outside the box. I have found often I have to leave the College of Business for the big ideas. Sometimes I have to link the, the, the business students together with the science students, or the engineering students, or the sociology students, or, oh, heaven forbid, the liberal arts students. That's where the big ideas are because they don't even know what's legal. And they're thinking outside the box. It's thinking, and I could tell stories on that that I, I can't. I should never repeat. Um, I've had students arrested. The bottom line is, is that you've got to think big. You've got to think big. Now, here are some revolutions in waiting. There are big ideas being talked about on these, I these items right now. We don't have closure on these areas. And I just threw up a, a laundry list here. Healthcare, medicine, education. Energy is huge. I've been down to Texas, and I'll talk about T. Boone Pickens in a little bit. He wants me to call him Boone. Boone. Boone is an industry oil giant. He's made a fortune off oil. The man's over 80 years old. You ought to hear his vision now. He's thinking big all over again. We'll talk about him in a second. Waste disposal. What do we do with waste? We're not very good at that. We don't have a solution. We don't have a solution. We pile it higher. It gets stinkier. It gets deeper. We want to ship it off and dump it in the ocean or find some state that's willing to let us dump it into some hole in the ground. I, I even have a friend who is, has found good money in when you drain an oil well. His deal is take the waste and pump it back in the oil well. <laughs> and he's making money. That's not a solution. That's not a solution. Waste disposal. Communication continues to be huge and changes all the time. Global warming, whether you agree with it or not, is a big issue. Is a big issue. Poverty continues to be a big issue. Um, if you ever get a chance to read anything by C. Caper Holland and the bottom of the pyramid, microventuring, this is huge. This is most of mankind. We don't have a solution. Um, peace through commerce, it's growing. It's growing. One of the reasons we have so much unrest in the world is people are hungry. People don't feel like they have a fair shake in the world economy or a, a fair shake in life. They're angry. One way to solve that is peace. How do we do that? How do you go into Afghanistan and start micro ventures? We're trying to do that at Notre Dame. 
How do you go into a rock and do that and make sure the students come back alive? That's a big deal. We don't have a good solution. Microventuring in general and poverty. Um, I can tell you right now, um, agriculture. A lot about agriculture, but not just agriculture, but distribution of agriculture. Feeding the people. These are all big ideas and we don't have solutions for them. If anything up there just flips a trigger in the back of your mind that I've always thought about that. Start thinking about that. And what is the wildest, biggest dream you could come up with? And start working towards that. Those are the big ideas. Now, I've got to tell you, the right motivation. The right motivation, the revolution, is not about money. It is not about money. I can tell you right now in my experience, every time I have had a business or an entrepreneur come into my office with an idea and says, my goal is to make a lot of money. They never make it. Money cannot be the, the motivation. Now, I told you I was going to talk to you about Boone. So I went into T. Boone's office uh, down in Dallas. And I, it's everything you would expect it to be. It, it is everything you would expect it to be. He has one wall with magazines from all over the world with his picture on it. He has one wall with his picture with literally people you read about, but you don't really even know they exist. But he's, he's pictured with them. This guy is the real deal. And I had an afternoon with, with Boone Pickens. And, and what I want to know is, what, what motivates you, Boone? You made a gazillion dollars off oil, and now you're looking at natural gas. You're looking at energy policies for the United States. You're looking at wind energy and all kinds of different things. What motivates you? And I says, Boone, take me back to your first startup. Where did you start? And I love this story. And he looked at me like I was on drugs um, because he thought I wanted to talk about oil. And, and here I am saying, bring me back to your childhood. He was a kid in Oklahoma. And you know what his first venture was? A paper route. Seven years old. I says, man. I says, we out? How much money? It wasn't about the money. First off, they told me I couldn't do it because I was seven. And I wanted to show them a seven-year-old could do it. Then his next motivation was, OK, now is what I want to do is show that I can do it more efficiently by combining these six roots. It was not about the return. It was not about the money that drove his idea. And then he talked about oil. And he's, but he didn't talk about money. Money's a way to keep score. Money's a natural outcome of the thing. But that's, that's not what he talked about. That's not what he talked about. He talked about making a difference. And in my experience, there's a lot of different reasons, a lot of different motivations for the big deal. But it comes down to three. One is to fix something that's broken, something that's not working. That, that's a big deal. To keep something alive that is, and keep something alive, a good, something that's good alive and make it better. That's a good motivation. To keep something from going away that's good is a big deal. Your motivation has to be right. And in my experience, if your motivation is money, it's the wrong motivation. It's the wrong motivation. Every time I've seen success with this, it has been a different motivation. In fact, you know this guy? Try this. Goldman just <laughs> did a valuation on Facebook. $50 billion, and they invested in, in Facebook. Well, I got to tell you, his name is Zuckerberg. And boy, look how happy he is. He's a young, happy Zuckerberg because the business he started now was just given a valuation of $50 million. But, and as I looked at this, I thought, man, what, what's the smile here? Where's that smile coming from? I want to know what motivated this young Harvard student to set up Facebook. Well, let me, let me just do a poll. How many of you have a Facebook account? Ta-da, Zuckerman wins. I don't. My children told me not to. OK. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's strange. They says, this is our space, Dad. You stay off it. OK. Um, happy? Money? Did this, is this it? No. Let me show you what he said. It's not because of the amount of money. For me and my colleagues, the most important thing is that we create an open information flow for people. Having media corporations owned by conglomerates is just not an attractive idea to me. For him, that was a wrong. Facebook is the correction. Money, it's going to come. Money's going to come. 
but doing something big for the right reason was a better motivation. And honestly, if he went about it for the money, I don't think, I, I don't know that Facebook would be where it is today. This was his motivation. All right. USU. I love this story. USU. I've got to tell you, I read the history of USU. Big idea? Was this university a big idea? It was a big idea. Anthony Lund is the guy that did a lot of work to launch this thing. Anthony Lund is an entrepreneur. He helped launch ZCMI, amalgamated sugar company. And this is way back when, in the 1860s, when the uh, Morrell Land Grant Act was passed. And the, the land grant said, the purpose of this act was to establish at least one college in each state upon a sure, perpetual foundation, accessible to all. Now get this one, get this one but especially to sons and daughters of toil. <laughs> In other words, these are the people that work hard. These are the people that usually don't get the opportunity to go to universities and colleges. He saw a need. And then he said, boy, there exists in Utah a need for a school fusing the highest in scientific and academic research with agriculture, the way of life for the majority of the locals. There's a need for that. And then he observed, Provo has received the insane asylum. I don't know what university that is. Salt Lake City had the university in capital. And the majority of the legislature felt that a new institution should be given to Weber and Cache Valleys. This was a big idea. He opened this university in farm country. This was a big idea. And if you ever get a chance to take a look at USU, uh, pictorial history. Take a look at where they started and how it grew. It's amazing. This was a big idea. So lesson number one, big idea. Rockefeller said, if you want to succeed, you should strike out on new paths rather than travel the worn paths of accepted business. New paths. Think differently. Think differentiation. In your strategy class, you're going to hear that a lot. Differentiation. Competitive advantage comes from being unique and setting yourself aside, making yourself different. Those are the big ideas. And again, investors, and believe me, I work with a lot of investors, angels, venture capitalists, banks, um, internal uh, corporate venture funds, they're looking for big ideas. They don't want the same old, same old. They don't want the same old pizza. So lesson number one, you need a big idea. OK, so you come up with a big idea. That's great. Time for lesson number two. Lesson number two is you need a solid business model. Now you guys come to the table, OK? The arts and letters folks have had their fun. Liberal arts have come up with this wacky idea. They've fought with their hearts. Now they need somebody to think with their heads. They need a business model. They need a business model. Two weeks ago, I worked with uh, the nanotechnologists on campus. Notre Dame has a real initiative in nanotechnology an important initiative. And these are scientists, and they get the science of the whole thing, but they don't get the business stuff at all. It needs logic. As Einstein said, innovation is not the product of logical thought. It's just not. It's illogical to come up with the big ideas that I'm talking about. Although the result is always tied to logical structure. You've got to have a business model to make the thing work. Now. In the Entrepreneurship Center at Notre Dame, I will have some of the wackiest ideas that you can ever imagine. Um, very often, I will have a student or someone from the community that will come in and say, oh, I've got it. I've got a huge idea. Is all I need is the science to make it happen. Can you find the scientist that can write the, can invent the, can do the? I've got to tell you. This is where the business model comes in. You've got to have the product. You've got to have all the loose ends tied up. The bottom line is, you've got to have a model. Have you used a disciplined approach? Do you know your product? I mean, do you really know your product? You're going to be the best salesman of that idea, by the way. I don't care whether you're in a corporation or an entrepreneur. You are going to sell that idea. You are a salesperson. Um, do you know your market? Do you really know the customer? Do you know what attributes the customer is looking for? Do you really know their psychosocial needs? Do you really understand your customer? Uh, do you know the solid financial model? 
Do you know the revenue model? Do you have a strong business model? Does your venture have legs? That's what we, every time, does it have legs? That's what I hear from the investment community all the time. Does it have legs? Does it have legs? Can this venture take off? Can it be sustained? Can you block the competition from just coming in and taking over? Um, is your timing right? I happen to know that there are industries, uh, pharmaceutical and high-tech industries, that are already generations ahead of the market. And they, you go into their closet and they have ideas, they have patents, and it's all, they're generations ahead. And they're just waiting for the right time to launch the new technology to the market. Because the market isn't ready for it. Their timing has to be just right. Sometimes technology is, uh, the big idea comes out and the market isn't ready. The market has to be ready. So the timing has to be right. And this is the key here. You know what you know, but you may not know what you don't know. And so you've got to talk to other people. You may need mentoring. Know what you don't know. Know your blind spots. Know what you don't know. And that comes to lesson number three. Once you know what you don't know, now you need to develop a network to make up for those gaps. So this is lesson number three. Lesson number three is making up for those knowledge gaps, the gaps in your business model, the gaps in the technology model that you don't have. You haven't got it. You haven't got it right. I don't have a financial person. We well, gotta do something about that. I call it putting together the right wolf pack. And man, I gotta tell you, when you put a wolf pack together, you gotta make sure that you have the right wolves in the pack. Otherwise, you're just target practice. And I'll tell you, doing it by yourself is high risk. It's always better to get the right team. Boy, Bill Godfrey, you should have seen his team. After I read his team, I was reaching for my wallet, man. I was ready to invest because he had the right team. Those people had been there. They'd done it. They'd been successful at everything they'd tried. Oh, well, they had a few uh, bad startups, but man, that added, that added experience to the team. When you saw the management team, even if you thought, my gosh, this is nuts starting a software when everything else is crashing to start this, once you saw the team, you were on board. You were on board once you saw that team. It was the real deal. It was the real deal. Um, sometimes you will take a look at your deal and you'll say, you know what? This is the right deal. I have the business model, but I'm not the guy to lead this thing. I had a, uh, a team of MBAs, and I've told this story to the, uh, the entrepreneurship leadership last, uh, last time I was here. I had a team of, of uh, undergraduate students. Uh, Xavier Halverson was in my class, and, and he wanted to start a business by selling books online. He took a book to the bookstore, tried to get, have you ever tried to sell books back to the bookstore? You know what kind of return you get on that book from the bookstore? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no. And so he says, I'm going, to, I'm going to take this thing, and I'm going to take it online. And that's exactly what he did. And he says, my gosh, I'm making money on this thing. And so then he went up and down the hallway saying, I'll sell your books. I'll sell your books. I'll kind of give you a little bit, and I'll keep. And so he started making money. And he wrote a plan. And the result was this. He wrote a plan for a company called Better World Books. Okay. He and his undergraduate partner recognized that they did not have the experience and skills to lead this to a big deal. I put uh, an investor as kind of a mentor to the team. And guess what? They ended up hiring the angel investor as their CEO, David Murphy out of Atlanta. And David Murphy quit his job as a bank officer to become CEO of Better World Books. Better World Books is now a worldwide organization. It's the second largest online book sales organization in the world. Um, they are in Scotland. They're soon to be in Romania. Uh, it's a phenomenal organization. It's a but they knew what they didn't know. And they knew they needed a wolf pack. They knew that they had to have something more than just them. Because they didn't have the skills to lead the thing. Now, oh, this is interesting. This is an interesting map. This is a map of where startups have come. Technology startups. I want you to, and this is global. Let's, let's focus in on the United States. Check this out. Here we are. The United States. And this is pretty interesting analysis. These are high-tech startups and where they're, where they're taking place. 
Silicon Valley, huge. Uh, Texas, Texas Austin, down in Tech, big. Boston, big. Chicago, Wisconsin, big. South End, Bend, Indiana, where Notre Dame is. We don't even have a number. We don't even. Here's the Intermountain area, 594. I checked into that. A lot of them are along Wasatch Front. And I'm telling you guys to, to get a wolf pack. I'm telling you guys to build a team. And, and usually is what I hear in South Bend. We're in South Bend, Indiana. There's nothing here. There's no investors here. We're in South Bend, Indiana. We're two hours away from Chicago. There's nobody here to put on our team. So how do we do it from South Bend, Indiana? I actually hear, how do you do it from Logan? How do you put together a killer team from Logan, Utah? Have you noticed that Logan's kind of in the corner of the state? It's, there's, there's not a lot of heavy industry. Anybody know of any venture capital firms in the community? I know of some, some angels in the community. How do you build this world-class team? Well, I've got to tell you, Logan is not a whole lot different than South Bend, Indiana. It's not a whole lot different. And yet you have to build this world-class team to build that big deal. Now, by the way, if I'm inside a company, it doesn't change. Because I'm looking inside the company, I'm looking outside the company, I'm still trying to build that team. There we go again, Zuckerberg from social networking. Social networking has opened up all kinds of possibilities for building that team. You know where this guy built his team? I love it. This guy hired away executives from Google. Have you heard about what Google, what it's like to work for Google? Google's a fun place to work. Google, you can bring your dog to work at Google. Do you know that they have a masseuse that comes every, every day to, to Google to give massages to the employees? They keep it flat and happy. It's a hap, hap, happy place to work. Why would you ever want to leave? I mean, it's, why would you ever want to leave Google? Well, to do something big. And it's what he did was go into the executives of Google and said, I'm doing something huge here. Would you want to be a part of something big? You've done Google. Are you ready for the next big? And he's hired away top executives from Google to play with him and Facebook. It's, an, it's, it's amazing. He knew what he didn't know. And a lot of people are saying, should this guy be the CEO, chairman of the board for Google? They're asking that question. He says, I know what I don't know. And I know that I need a team to make this thing happen. All right? So how? Here's the how. Look in your own backyard. Now, here's what I did. This was an eye opener for me. I decided to look at your alumni um, for this university. Do you guys have any idea who is on the alumni for this university? Do you realize what they could do for you on a new venture? It is incredible. It is incredible. OK. Um, in politics, OK, you've got uh, the governor of Arizona. Um, you have the governor of Nevada. Um, you have the executive director of, get this, United Nations Environment Programs. Do you think they might have something to do with agriculture? Probably. Um, you have uh, the uh, former director of the Bureau of Land Management. You have Harry Reid, and I, you have Harry Reid. Uh, <laughs> Notice how I handled that. I was, moving on. <laughs> I'm going to go right into the business side of things. <laughs> I knew when I brought that up. I, OK, let me try business. And this is the guy that I want to meet. You have a guy by the name of Nolan Bushnell, who founded both Atari and, can you know what else he, he founded? Atari and? Chuck E. Cheese. Chuck e. Cheese. Atari and Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Atari, high tech. And he's sitting back there at night and said, man, I wish I had a pizza. And you know what? It ought to be delivered by a big rat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was he thinking? But here's a guy. Here's a guy. Here's a guy that knows how to do high tech startups and pizza. And not just pizza, but a, 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 a big idea. I mean, I don't know about you, but. Gosh, 
My kids growing up, I did more Chuck E. Cheese parties than you can imagine. And the pizza's not that great, but it worked. Uh, so you have Bushnell. <laughs> How about this? You have the founder of Prodigy. You have the president of Nike brands. Uh, you have the president COO of MGM Mirage Inter International. You have the co-founder and president of Overstock.com. You have the founder of Micron Technology. You have the global CEO of Deloitte Touche. And on and on and on. Monaco Coach, Coach Corporation, he's my neighbor in Elkhart, Indiana. The bottom line is, is that they're there. They're in your own backyard. If I had to start a big deal, if I wanted to start, start forming my team, I'd start looking at my alumni. And you know what? Every time I had a speaker here from industry, I would not leave until I had their card. True. I would build a network that was killer. And I have a stack of cards that I'd make sure that I would make a card. I don't care if you're a freshman, make a card. And it's all you have to say is, student USU, and put the seal there. Become an Aggie. <laughs> and I know what that means. Uh, the, <laughs> the bottom line is, is uh, the bottom line is, is have a card. So that when you leave, you introduce yourself, give them your card, get their card. Build a network. I can tell you whether you do a $500 million deal or just looking for a job, that is going to be the most powerful thing you can have leaving this university, is a great network. Now I looked at the web and I looked at the people you've had come through this university speaking. And you've had some pretty dang big names. I look down the pike and see who's coming. And you've got some pretty big names coming. Were I in your shoes? <clears throat> I would make a point of not hitting the door as quick as it's over. I would make a deal of going up, introducing myself, and getting that card. Getting that card. Building your network. Building your network. You know another good time to, to build your network? And that's during football games. Do you know how many alumni um, Investors, donors, come to football games? Oh, it's incredible. I don't know whether you guys do the tailgating that we do at Notre Dame, but my gosh, the tailgating starts on Thursday, the football game sometime on Saturday. Um, <laughs> and I mean to tell you, that is the time to meet and greet. Get out of your bubble and build your network. Okay? You can do it here in Logan. If I can do it in South Bend, Indiana, you can do it in Logan, Utah. The network is there, but you've got to initiate it. I would hit your alumni base, find out who they are. Go to your alumni association. Tell them I am looking for a person that has this experience, working in this company, um, this industrial background. Find those people. I've got to tell you, when I do research and I want to get into a company, I'll go to the alumni office and say, find me somebody in this company. And it may simply be a salesperson. Or it may be somebody that's on the shop floor gluing stuff together. I don't care. That's my toe into that company. That is my entry into that company. Use your own alumni base. You can't imagine how powerful it is. And you know what else you get with your alumni base? They care about you. They have been you. They've been in your shoes. They care about you. When I go to the Notre Dame Alumni Network, you know what? They care about They'll bleed for Notre Dame. They will do anything for you. If you want somebody to read a plan, get somebody in that alumni base, have them read your plan. They care about you. They want nothing more than for you to succeed. And frankly, it makes them feel a little bit better to be needed. Go to that alumni base. Don't let a football game leave. with. Don't go to the football game painted blue and white unless you have cards in your back pocket to distribute. And hope for, they forget the paint. Um, <laughs> the bottom line is, it's in your backyard. There's no excuse. A big idea with a good business model, and now you've developed a network to overcome your inadequacies, and you've got them. You've got them. Be honest with yourself. If you don't have a marketing person, get one. Find one. If you don't think you're the right CEO, if, you need, if you're going into an industry and you have no experience in that industry, you better find somebody with experience in that industry. Because that's the way it's going to work. That's the way it's going to work. It's going to be hard for you to get investment in pharmaceuticals if you don't have any pharmaceutical experience. That's just the way it works. 
So the bottom line is, is build a meaningful network. And by the way, every person in your wolf pack, when you just decide what your wolf pack is, every person must add value. They must add value to the deal. If not, it's target practice for investors. What value do they add? I have seen plans where they add, <sighs> sorry mom, um, they'll say, I want my mom to be on my team, we're awfully close. And so they'll put their mom on the management team and I'll say, what value do they add? Well, she's my mom. You know, it's, if mom adds value, put mom on the team. Mom doesn't add value. I don't care if he's your best friend and you grew up together and they don't add value to the deal, don't put them on the team. It's target practice. For investors, they don't like to see that. They've got to add real value. Okay, lesson number four. Oh. Lesson number four is this, and this comes from, uh, I, these three points come from uh, Kawasaki, Guy Kawasaki. Uh, he wrote The Art of the Start, and he says, when it comes to being a revolutionary, there's three, three key steps you've got to know. He said, the first one, create like a god. That's my big idea. Get a big idea. Number two, command like a king. In other words, be confident of your idea. Don't milly mally mousy around the thing. Go for it. Build your network. Be confident of your idea. But here's number three, and I mean this most sincerely. Work like a slave. Big deals take work. I got my PhD from the University of Iowa. They filmed a movie in Iowa, something about build it and they will come. That doesn't work in business. Build it doesn't mean they're going to come at all. Okay. It takes work. I had this, ah, oh, I've got to tell you about the pie lady. There was a, a woman in my community that made the best apple pies you can imagine. I mean, I love to visit her because she'd always give me a pie. It was, you know, you get these apple pies. Hers were apple pies. And I mean, huh. She was fantastic, and that's what she did. She made these apple pies. She got all of her sons involved in the baking of these apple pies. And I'd come in, and there'd be shelves full of apple pies. And I said, "Well, you can start selling." She says, "We're baking the pies. They're gonna come. I know they're gonna come because they could just smell it. They know the pie. They'll come. They're not gonna come. You can get up at, at two o'clock in the morning, start baking pies. You're gonna have to work hard. You're gonna have to sweat with it. You're gonna have to." Sleep with it, it's gonna have to, it's it's gonna be, it's gonna consume you. For a big deal, you're going to have to work like a slave. Don't expect the market to come to you. Don't expect the problems to just simply vanish. You're going to have to work like a slave. Now, I've got to share some poetry with you. <laughs> this is one of my favorite poems if I can find it. All right, this is Shel Silverstein and the little blue engine. I love this. <laughs> okay, here he is. This is your deal. The little blue engine looked up at the hill. His light was weak and his whistle was shrill. He was tired and small and the hill was tall and his face blushed red. As she softly said, I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. So he started up with a chug and a strain, and he puffed and he pulled with might and main, and slowly he climbed a foot at a time, and his engine coughed as he whispered soft, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. With a squeak and a creak and a toot and a sigh, with an extra hope and an extra try, he would not stop. Now he neared the top, and strong and proud, he cried out loud, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. He was almost there when crash, smash, bash, he slid down and mashed into engine hash on the rocks below, which goes to show if the track is tough and the hill is rough, thinking you can just ain't enough. It's going to take work. It's going to take work. Um, I know several of the uh, companies that I've worked with, literally, where executives in the company spent 24 hours a day for weeks getting it right so that they could present it to the board of the directors. 
for a positive decision. I've known entrepreneurs that just didn't even bother to get an apartment because they slept at the business on the floor. <laughs> they ate a lot of ramen noodles. It takes sacrifice. And then even after all the work, uh, work, hard, work, work hard with diligence, integrity, and honesty, and you shall be rewarded. <sighs> I hate to show, share that with you. You're going to work hard. You're going to work hard, and the risks are going to be there. But you know what? We, if you don't work hard, you're going to be the blue engine, and you're going to crash. You're going to crash. Don't think it's going to be easy. Now, remember, this is more than just entrepreneurship. You're going to go into a business, and if you want to succeed in that business, in your new career, big ideas, good business models, develop a network, and work and sacrifice to make it happen, and then it'll happen. All right? Warren Bennis said, Warren Bennis said, innovation by definition will not be accepted at first. It takes repeated attempts, endless demonstrations, monotonous rehearsals before innovation can be accepted and internalized by an organization. This requires courageous patience. Work, work, work. All right, that's lesson number four. And every big deal that I've ever worked on, these people worked, they lived with it. Okay, here's my last lesson, okay? My last lesson is this one here. Risk and luck. And I put a, a roll of film here. Are you aware that for a National Geographic article that they take 14,000 pictures, 400 rolls of film to pick the 30 that they use in the article? That's what DeWitt Jones said, and he's a, he's a photographer for National Geographic. 14,000 pictures. And I don't know about you, I've got a digital camera. I mean, 14,000 is not very many for me now. I, mean, I take a picture of everything uh, all the time. There's a lot of risk. You're going to make mistakes. You're stepping into the unknown, especially if it's a big idea. Does it take luck? You're taking a risk. If it's going to be a big deal, you are going to take a risk. Does it take luck? Well, I don't know. Let's take a look at these guys. Bill Gates? Lucky? Lucky? Do you know how this, this man got started? Did he have an operating system? Where did he find his operating system? Somebody else had it, and he bought it for a song. I love that picture. <laughs> OK, here we have Steve Jobs. I tried to find the best pictures I could. Uh, this is Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, was he lucky? Okay, how many of you have an iPod? Yeah, is that luck? Okay, here's another question. How many of you have an iPad? Yeah, yeah me too. Yeah, iPads are cool. I strongly encourage you getting one. I have stock. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the bottom line is, is here he is. Was he lucky? We're back to Zuckerberg and Facebook. I love this one, because look at poor old Oprah. <laughs> He's jumping up and down on her couch. Was he lucky? And I have my friend Bill. Was he lucky? And I always start my strategy class. Is it strategy or is it luck? I did a major study at the University of Iowa on luck and strategy. And you know what I concluded? Good strategic planning increases the probability of a lucky outcome. OK? It increases the probability of a lucky outcome. You still have to have a big idea. You still have to have that, uh, a great business model. You still have to work like a slave. You still have to have the network. Once you've got all that, the probability of a lucky outcome is much, much higher. It's much, much higher. Prima Butler did a fantastic study. They found that luck, in, in fact, does play a role. This is, luck plays an important role in determining uh, the firm's strategic advantage or economic rents. That's what they found. But then they went on to say, however, even if a firm is lucky, it must still understand how it is lucky in order to take full advantage of its fortunate circumstances. So even if you're lucky, you better figure out why you're lucky <laughs> if you're going to be a $500 million firm. You've got to figure it out. The bottom line is, is that it does take a little bit of luck. There is a little bit of risk. 
in the end, you've got to have the right timing, the right idea, the right network. And it can work even here in Logan, Utah. It can work. The bottom line is, I've given you five lessons. I know that you can launch the next revolution here if you pay attention to these. And when somebody comes into my office, this is what I'm looking for. You're missing one of these, I get a little concerned. If you don't understand one of those, I get a little concerned. Now, I want to see revolutions coming out of Logan, okay? I want to see you guys flip the $500 million deals. I want to see you guys the next CEOs. You guys came to business school, you guys are working your tails off. A lot of you guys have families. You didn't come here to be crew. You came here to be captains. You didn't come here to, be, to work the shop floor. You came here to be president. Think big. Don't think little. Don't think little. This is your opportunity. Take full advantage of it. This is your turn, your time to network. There's never going to be a better in time in your life than right now. This is it. This is it. Take full advantage of it and launch that revolution. And I'll be reading the newspaper, and then we'll split whatever you make. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for coming today, and I hope this helped you. <clears throat> let's go ahead. We have a few t uh, minutes to take some questions. Uh, so let's open up the floor. Any questions? Uh, about being blessed by the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> I, this was an, an, a bizarre deal. As a Notre Dame professor, there I, you get to know the Notre Dame or the Catholic network fairly well. I was going to Rome. Um, I was going to Rome with my dad and my son, and I said oh, it would be fun to see the Pope. And so I networked around and did the networking thing, and I wrote Rome, <laughs> and I wrote the counselor to the Pope, who uh, had Notre Dame connection. And I says I'm a lowly professor at Notre Dame. And uh, I didn't tell him I wasn't Catholic, but I, I says, I'm a lowly professor from Notre Dame, and I'd love to meet the Pope. And uh, I got a note back, and he says, we'll take care of it. I didn't know what that meant. And so I'm sitting in my hotel, we'd gone on tours that day, and this concierge comes out, and his hands are shaking. And he's got a golden envelope, and he says, it's from the Pope. <laughs> I, says, I says, how cool is this? <laughs> this is really cool. And so um, my dad and I, and, and my son, who was 16, we were invited to New Year's Mass with the Pope. And I thought, how cool is this? New Year's Mass with the Pope. And I thought, well, this, we're going to be one of hundreds. This is just our ticket to get in the front gate. So we went up to the front doors, and we showed them our ticket. And you know, if you've been to Rome and you've seen the, uh, the, the Swiss Guard, how they're dressed, two of these guys with submachine guns came up. I thought, we're dead. The Pope wants us dead. He doesn't like Notre Dame. We didn't have a good season. Um, so, so here's what he does. He, they march us behind the Vatican. We come in the back doors with the cardinals, about 200 of them. We weren't dressed for the occasion, but there we were. We walked in with the cardinals, and they sat us right with the royalty of Rome on the front row. The Pope comes in, and he stands from me to you, he, he knew I needed the blessing. <laughs> I guess I panicked. You know, he, he gave, yeah, just, he gave me the blessing. And so I had, yeah, I've been blessed by the Pope. John Paul, the one from Poland, not the German one. <laughs> so yeah, that's my blessing from the Pope. I've had a couple of uh, other occasions with the Pope on other visits to Rome, but that one was, that one was extra special. Did you get his business card? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Did I mention the machine guns? <laughs> Those guys didn't leave me. <laughs> they, they thought I looked a little shaky. Any other questions? All right, guys, I want you to think big. Don't think small. Break the rules, but don't break the law. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. And let's, let's do big deals, okay? It's great working with you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Here we have a little. Oh, thank you. Well done. Thank you. Really well done. Thanks.